Okay. Um, welcome to today's Senate occasional lecture. I'm Jackie Morris. I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure in the Department of the Senate. In welcoming all of you here today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, the Ngambri and Ngunnawal peoples, and their elders past and present. A hundred years ago, a learned society proposed that the Federal Parliament appoint Royal Commissioners of Science. They would have a right to be heard in the Parliament on any matter in which scientific knowledge played a part, and a mandate to use language that the MPs and the general public would understand. In recent years, the Parliament has considered a growing list of matters in which scientific knowledge plays a significant part. Alas, the proposal to appoint Royal Commissioners for Science has not progressed quickly. Today, the government employs thousands of scientists and technicians in its research labs, including the CSIRO. While they may not have a representative in the parliament, their significant contribution to public life is the subject of today's lecture. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, the chief scientist of the CSIRO, Dr. Cathy Foley. Dr. Foley is an award-winning researcher and team leader in solid state physics. Her work has resulted in the development of smarter and more effective mineral exploration tools. She's a thought leader in the scientific community and an advocate for the participation of women and girls in science. Dr. Foley's agreed to take some questions at the end of the lecture, so we'll have a bit of time when we get there. And she's also promised to use language which we will all understand. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Foley? So first of all, um, thank you for the invitation to speak. It's a huge honour. Um, I just think being able to speak uh, about my passion of science and its, its impact on uh, society is something which being able to talk about in Parliament House is, is fantastic. And I, this is a, a sort of a new idea of actually looking at our government labs and you know, it's something where I'm sure whenever budget time comes around and everyone's looking at the budget thinking, uh, particularly in government, saying uh, what do we spend our money on and what we don't. I thought it was interesting to think about the investment and why, why, why have we invested in government labs over the years and has it done anything for anyone? But before I do that, I want to start actually by acknowledging the traditional owners of our land um, and acknowledge our elders past and present and also emerging um, uh, Indigenous people. And the reason I want to do that is that um, they've been around and looked after this continent for over 65,000 years. And uh, it's a, a, a fragile continent. It's one which uh, really has a, a lot of difference to many other parts of the globe. And when we put it into context of where we are now compared to where we, the world was 65,000 years ago, in 1788 there was uh, European colonisation and then an amazing thing happened in, um, in 1901 when we saw federation, which is pretty unusual where states, which in the past, if you look at places like the USA, they had to have a, um, a, rev a revolution to bring together a country. Uh, we were able to do that peacefully. Uh, then we had a whole lot of wars, and here we are today. In that time, say from 1915 to, uh, say, uh, 2015, and this is just because that's when I could get some numbers, some good things have happened. We have seen, for example, uh, back in 1915, only one in 20 people were over the age of 65. So many of you wouldn't be here today. Um, and, and now it's one in five are over the age of 65. If, um, if you look back um, nearly 100 years ago, there were uh, many more men than women, but now it's the other way around. And if we look at infant mortality, it was about 10% infant mortality, while now it's less than 1%, which is one of the best in the world, although it's not universal and not uniform across the country, unfortunately. So in health and wellbeing, in many ways, there's been huge advances. But we can't say that's necessarily the case on our continent. So if you look at the prickly pear, rabbits, erosion, uh, we, we created a wool industry, but the problem was uh, the wool was all uh, very prickly, shrank, and, and was very difficult to actually put into, into garments and fabric. Uh, we had a whole lot of cows, which created a, another problem, and that was the um, cow poo or dung actually didn't uh, break down because there were no insects to break that down. And so as a consequence, we ended up with huge numbers of flies. And if you go through looking over the um, decades, 
You can see you know, we're agriculture, which is a major part of our economy, a major part of our ability to exist, has had its highs and lows from fertility um, of the soil through to uh, what is the right thing to grow, the erosion, uh, how, how we actually go through and understand agriculture in itself has, has, has been something which needed to be addressed. So over that time since Federation, the government recognised that it needed to do something about it and quite often it was requiring a science solution. So the first thing of any, any place is you want to know how many people you've got. So the Bureau of Statistics was set up in 1905, and then a year later, we need, always worry about the weather in Australia, and uh, they introduced uh, the Bureau of Meteorology. And then a little bit later, they introduced, well, they called it something else, it was the, um, uh, the uh, National Survey Office, and they, which is now called Geoscience Australia, because we need to understand exactly uh, where is the best place to do things, where, where are there minerals, where is there water. And then in 1916, CSIRO was created, and that was because uh, some of those issues really needed to have a science solution. And there was that question, can science lead to the outcomes that are needed? Uh, CSR also did some of the work for, um, for the government in terms of defence applications, but then in 1940 they decided to pull that out separately and uh, the defence science and technology part of defence was set up and defence science and technology organisation was created. I think it had a different name then. And then um, as agriculture became more and more important and, uh, and tricky in a, in a dry nation and a dry continent with uh, very... Um, very uh, uh, different soil to, to the richness of, say, Europe, the uh, Department of what is now um, um, Agriculture and Water Resources set up um, a um, special laboratory looking at, at uh, agriculture. And um, then in uh, the 40s, they set up uh, the Antarctic Division, as we realised there's a whole continent um, at the bottom of the globe of which Australia wanted to have a part in. And then uh, the nuclear uh, world happened in the 50s, and so we saw ANSTO being created, the Australian National Science and Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. And then there was a recognition that um, we actually have a huge amount of ocean, which is part of our nation. In fact, the ocean part of our, our, our um, country is the same size as Western Australia. And so it was realised that we didn't really have enough investment in the research and development and understanding of the, our ocean um, part. So setting up the Australian Institute of Marine Science occurred. And then as uh, therapeutic goods became uh, and medicines became something of an uh, important part of our health and wellbeing, the government set up the um, TGA or the Therapeutic Drugs, uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration to really make sure that anything we have available to us as humans um, was something was going to be safe. Then in uh, 2004, the National Measurement Institute, which was in, um, splattered around in different places, so some of it was in CSIRO and some of it was in other, part, in other organisations, was bringing together all the national standards of the nation in order to make sure that we were able to have the uh, regulation and the um, uh, physical standards and necessary, things necessary to be able to have and undertake uh, the appropriate trade and also all the things that make the world work. And then just last year, we launched the Australian Space Agency, where there's a rec recognition that the whole uh, world out there in the universe is something, not just putting uh, people on Mars, but also the whole idea of how... Um, a space agency is a, a missing link in, a, in the potential of how we engage both locally, and I'll show you a little bit about what they're planning to do in a minute, but also how we have to be part of that um, under engagement with um, what's up in the heavens. So just having a look at the patchwork of all the different sorts of funding that the government has in things research, this is something that was put together by... Um, uh, the uh, Innovation Science Australia um, organisation last year, I think it was. And so you've got there in the orange area, that's uh, the research funds that go mostly into universities. And then the blue area at the bottom is the uh, R&D tax concessions, which are um, the um, way that industry uh, is supported by government with uh, its research. And then you've got um, down at the bottom here, um, oh, I won't, the um, R directed research and... Um, R&D research investment in funding special areas. So, for example, the ARENA research funding, which looks at funding others to be able to do research in um, new techniques for energy provision. 
And then you've also got the Research and Development Corporation funds, which are funds that come from a sort of a tax that's taken on, um, on a particular area, whether it's grains or, or other areas. But in the middle there, there's this, um, the publicly funded research agencies, which I've gone through uh, most of them uh, just previously. And this is a, a group which in the past we don't normally see as a, a, a collective of, of capability. And I just wanted to just have a quick look at. So the government puts about $2 billion worth of appropriation into those government labs. And uh, they augment this by a, a range of uh, what we call revenue, whether it might be some of the funds that come from competitive grants such as from ARENA, or it also might be from um, engagement with industry and end users. So, that's, you know, so that, that funding is, is heavily leveraged. It actually employs 20,000 people, which means that there's a whole re, um, career pathway which has just been ignored, because it's not often we say, do a degree in science, and uh, think, people think often as a university is the only pathway to uh, being a researcher. And yet there's this huge cohort of people there who have um, often uh, committed their lives to working in organisations to do research for public good. They actually do just under 5% of the research that is published in journal papers. And the research quality is way above average. So if you say that a measure of research excellence is uh, the citations, so that's how often uh, papers are written and referred to by other, other researchers. And the world, they've gone through and done a normalisation of one is the world average. So Australians average using all the research is about 1.4. But the government labs actually have 1.5. So we're actually doing research on average better than, um, say, universities. We are the, hold, the, la the holder of the largest number of patents. So we actually invent things that then translate into uh, being used for commercial purposes. And it's always done in collaboration or mostly done in collaboration with others. So that over 90% of the work is done by working with other people. And, uh, and going, looking at quality, if we say that 1% of the research is in the top 1% then of, of quality, the uh, research that is done by government agencies, 2.5% of that is in that top 1%, which means that they're kicking uh, above or hitting above their, their weight. And the same with the top 10%, if we look at the next tier, it's nearly 20%. So it's showing that we do excellent research. So I want to just have a look at a couple of the um, organisations and just give you an idea of where they touch your life every day. So the National Measurement Institute is probably all of them the one that touches their, your life in every moment, from making sure that when you hear what time uh, it's uh, midday and you listen to uh, the beeps on the, um, on the ABC telling you the time, it's um, at the hour, those beeps come from the NMI up at Linfield. Uh, so they run the time and frequency standards. Uh, when you buy a kilogram of tomatoes or you go and weigh yourself, making sure that your um, weight is correct is dependent on the whole way of making sure that anything you buy, which has got a measurement to it, has actually been linked in to all the way down to what you're seeing there, which is the kilogram standard. Uh, that's a lump of platinum, which resides up in our site at, Linf at the NMI site at Linfield, and it actually goes on holidays to Paris to be compared with the other lumps of platinum. And there's been a problem. The lumps have been growing in weight over the years because they oxidise and gather a bit of oxygen out and mix in, and so it gets a little bit lighter. And you're talking about uh, measuring it to uh, decibel points way out. So last month, something very exciting happened, and that was they changed the it's the only physical um, standard. And up until then, they had actually... Uh, been looking at how, can we instead of having our standard dependent on a lump of metal, can we actually do it where it's based on a physical con co um, constant? Because then we can make sure that it always goes back to something which doesn't change. So some work was done with, within Australia over many years, and what you're looking at there is the most perfect ball in the world. And uh, that's a ball of silicon. And they, going back to your chemistry days, the Avogadro's number is uh, sort of a standard chemical number that says how many atoms are in a certain um, container, what they call a mole. All right, and it's used as a way of just uh, being able to identify uh, lumps of, uh, and compare lumps of, of amounts of materials. So they've been able to use that silicon ball and go back and say that the kilogram is now linked to what's called Planck's constant. And so that means that we no longer have to worry about the kilogram and our weight slowly going up, that we can actually now have um, a, 
um, a, con a, a standard in weight that goes all the way back to a, 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 a constant which doesn't change. So the NMI actually has a, a huge influence on you. So when you buy your, your petrol, that you make sure that regardless of the weather and the temperature, you still get your litre per whatever it is, $1.50 a litre or whatever, through to um, making sure that when you get your blood tests done, that they actually are correct because they go through making sure that they accredit the way that's done. Very important part. ANSTA, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, actually touches many people. Uh, they deliver 10,000 uh, 10, patient, patient doses of nuclear material every week. And every, one in two P Australians are going to be benefiting from uh, nuclear medicine sometime in their lifetime, um, a, as well as the research, fundamental research they do in understanding materials through having um, the engagement of materials with neutrons as well as um, engaging with industry, particularly understanding things relating to the structure of, uh, for example, uh, hardware that's used for um, building bridges and locomotives and things like that. Um, AIMS, the um, Australian Institute of Marine Science, is really uh, top of mind at the moment because they've, they've been really focusing on how can we save the Great Barrier Reef. But it, and this is just taken from their website last night, which is just going through looking at all the sorts of things that they work on so that we actually are able to have, make sure that the oceans around the nation uh, have that uh, ability to provide um, the marine life we eat, the fisheries, plus also uh, being able to make sure that the environment is right. Uh, and especially with the threat of the Great Barrier Reef and, and the impact of um, whether it's um, global warming and the temperature rising, whether it's runoff from um, land, or whether it's other things that are happening in the, um, the oceans are still not fully understood. Defence Science and Technology Group actually affects every one of us every day in ways you wouldn't think. Uh, their, I guess, biggest claim to fame is the invention of the flight recorder, which is on every single commercial flight. So whenever you fly anywhere, anywhere around the world, you know that there's a bit of Australia on every flight. Um, and that's been absolutely critical as anyone who enjoys watching the gory um, TV show every week on uh, uh, the greatest uh, aircraft accidents and where they go through and uh, try and figure out what happened. Uh, that flight recorder is always raised as the absolutely critical piece. And, um, and that's something that came out of our Defence Science and Technology Group. And something else that's really interesting is the invention of uh, the over-the-horizon Jindalee radar. And that's something which is uh, unique, and it shows why we have to do things in Australia. Because Australia's in a position where we've got a huge landmass, it's pretty empty, and uh, we want to be able to see what's coming over the horizon. And this is a whole new novel way of being able to look for, um, for uh, radar signals to be able to see what's coming. And you can sort of see how it operates where this radar has an enormous um, um, uh, fan out of, of sensitivity and has been really critical for the defence and security of Australia. The Bureau of Meteorology is one which, uh, as I mentioned before, Australia loves worrying about the weather for good reason. And in fact, the Bureau of Meteorology m measures weather and every day when you look at it on the news or look at it on your phone, uh, that's where the information comes from. And it's actually one of Australia's top websites. So along with Google and uh, Facebook, uh, Bureau of Meteorology is, depending on who's done the measurement, somewhere between the top 10 and top 50. So it's something which not only uh, uh, providing a service, but is absolutely critical because it allows us to plan and look into the future to make sure that we're ready for uh, particularly major events. And then just finally, the Australian Space Agency, which started last year. And their aim is to develop civil science priorities for uh, looking at can we have our positioning and navigation better, um, Earth observation, so that we can use information from satellites to actually understand what's happening so that we can do things such as look at migration of birds or um, weeds to fight biosecurity better, uh, communications and technology services, uh, situational awareness and um, debris monitoring up in space, uh, seeing if we can leapfrog uh, our research and development so that we can create a whole new industry for Australia, looking at robotics and automation and access to space. So these are things which are um, very exciting and as hugely inspiring, particularly for young people. I know in a couple of weeks' time we're going to be seeing um, 50 years since uh, we had put a person on the moon 
and Australia was deeply involved with that. And uh, this is a good timing for us to use that to particularly inspire our, our, genera our youth generation coming through to think about science and technology as being a, um, a career path for them and something to inspire them to realise that the future jobs, the future prosperity for the nation really does depend on them choosing to do science and maths at school and possibly thinking about doing it um, uh, degrees in science at university and working in um, a whole range of different industries that will be dependent on this sort of technologies. So I actually think that government labs are, hu are hidden gems. They're mission directed, so it's not like they just go off and do whatever they want to re research on. They actually are working for a purpose. They've got government support, which is absolutely critical, but they're able to leverage that because of the importance of their work by engaging with others. The work they do protects our population, which is really important. It supports the economy, and it has extraordinary long-term effects. It's full of committed people, and that's something which is really interesting. The, most of the, uh, many of the people who work in the organisation have worked there for decades because of that longevity of, um, of the work that they do, because it's not just something which is a quick solution, but it's something where there's a whole um, swathe of work that needs to be done over a period of time to solve a, uh, solve a problem. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. So they've worked for many, many years. And it's, I think, a hidden career opportunity, because I think a lot of people don't realise that there's a pathway there, which I think would be great to open up. I, I think it's value for money. And collectively, it uh, means that we're, as a, a nation, ready for anything and that we're able to uh, pull together what's necessary to solve the major challenges that keep turning up on our doorstep. And I think as a nation, I think it'd be great if we could be proud of that and inspire everyone to think that there's work that is being done that is using the brilliance of human minds to be able to really turn things around and be able to uh, solve some of those difficult problems we've made for ourselves in some cases. So I want to now uh, be coming, working for CSRO, have a little bit of focus on our organisation and use it as a case study to give you an, an idea of how we're thinking and how we're also shifting as time's going on because the world is changing. So let's just look at the history a little bit. If we go back to 1916 when um, Billy Hughes finally announced the creation of, of CSRO, uh, it's, it was started with half a million dollars in today's term. It was £5,000 back then. So whenever any of our staff complain, complain about our budget, I always uh, point out, well, actually, we've come a long way. But the thing is interesting, this is an, a newspaper article I found in the archives um, in, from the um, uh, National Library. And it was written in the 60s, and it had a little quote in it, which I think is still relevant today. And that is, wherever you go in this country, you will find some evidence of the activity of CSRO as an institution that has proved of inestimable uh, value of the nation's progress. And I think that's what we do aspire to, not just in CSRO, but all government labs, is that we're here to actually contribute to the progress of the nation. So remember the problems that uh, we, I mentioned earlier on, the prickly pear? Well, CSRO was set up originally to, um, to deal with that problem and introduce the cactoblastus moth, which was able to keep it under control. And although there's been some bad examples of um, introduced pests, such as the dreaded cane toad, CSRO had nothing to do with that, and that's a good example of when you should have asked CSRO to do that. <laughs> uh, the rabbits. So the rabbits were a huge problem, and we introduced a Khaleesi, uh, the uh, myxomatosis and, more recently, the Khaleesi virus uh, to keep uh, rabbits under control. In the 1940s, during World War II, um, CSRO developed the first radar system. And the thing that's really interesting is since then, um, when we've moved away from doing defence work, uh, Ruby Payne Scott, who was uh, a woman um, researcher working at CSRO at that time, uh, suggested that we should turn that radar and look at the heavens and be able to create radio astronomy, of which Australia is hugely uh, well known for and, has, uh, and um, is one of the world leaders in. And you're thinking, well, that's sort of out there where CSRO is still involved very deeply with the Parkes Telescope, for example, which helped us to be able to relay the information from and the pictures of man landing on the moon or humans landing on the moon. But the thing that's also interesting is that this research led to a whole lot of new things, such as uh, better communications. For example, the researchers in the uh, 1990s who were looking at can we work out a way of having a signal here, projecting it somewhere else and having a wireless communication, 
were able to use their, their knowledge from radio astronomy to be able to create Wi-Fi, which I think you must agree with me is probably one of the most ubiquitous um, inventions of modern day, which means that we can stand anywhere in the world with our phone and be able to connect everywhere. And, um, and so that's something which Australia invented, which CSRO invented, and has had enormous impact on modern world. And that came from our work in radio astronomy. Remember we talked about having uh, the sheep and the merino wool, which was itchy and shrank and all that? We were able to turn that, um, those beautiful looking sheep and the wool that they provide into a material by improving our weaving and knitting and, uh, and managing the fibre in a way so that uh, we change the way that uh, the whole world does its weaving and knitting. So for example, if you buy a suit and it has woven or fabric um, woven in Italy, that has uh, CSRO technology in it because although we no longer have a textile industry in Australia, we actually exported it to the world. So whether it's in China or in Italy or Europe, you will see that that is CSRO technology. So the ability to have yarn that is twisted in a certain way so it doesn't shrink, uh, being able to work out things like softly so you can wash without shrinkage and a whole range of different things that have allowed us to create a wool, uh, a wool or a fabric textile industry uh, from that wool. And although uh, we still have, and wool is still important and it's exported, it's something that still at the time in the 50s and 60s and 70s was an absolutely major part of our economy. And then remember the cow, prob uh, the cow pack problem with all the flies? Um, back in 1963, uh, we had the Queen coming to visit and they were very concerned she wanted to play tennis and go golfing and um, they were concerned about the flies. And so uh, in CSRO, we actually work with anyone and we will work with the royalty too, which is important. Um, and she was one of the first people to use Aerogard. And uh, it's an important CSRO invention. And, uh, and so we could say that the Queen sort of started that whole thing of having a good weekend, which is part of the Australian culture. But another thing they did was not only just having a uh, fix uh, something to keep the flies off, they also did a program of looking at uh, biological control of flies. And the problem, we had lots of flies from the cows, was because we didn't have the right insects to eat the cow pats. So there's been a very long period of research for over many decades of looking at the dung beetle. And in fact, we still have um, a lab in um, Montpellier in France where this is a, a major focus of introducing the dung beetle. So you might notice we don't have as many flies now, and that's because of the introduction of them. And that has to be a very delicate balance because we don't want to introduce an, another cane toad. Um, another thing which happened in the 1960s was that we actually had one of the world's first computers and again, this is really relevant as we're working, moving into the digital age, which is really uh, going to be part of our future solution. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But Australia had, uh, that's this um, Syriac, which you can go and see in Melbourne Museum um, down in Victoria. And, uh, and the reason that was introduced was to try and understand with all that radio astronomy data, they're gathering huge amounts of data and they needed to have some way of being able to manage it. And so, again, radio astronomy is leading the way in getting, uh, from a scientific perspective, using that as a case study to be a, or a use case to be able to work out what is the best way to be able to um, create an instrument, in this case a computer, to be able to manage this data. And so from there we've gone on and on, and um, although we're not known in Australia for creating computers, and that was done overseas, it's still part of our ability to use them and, and to be able to see into the future of what's necessary. So CSRO has made huge contributions to so many things um, which have just become every day um, in, our, in, our, in our world. But the thing is that um, it's not as though we've solved all the problems. Today, uh, as problems, they seem to be happening um, and things seem to be changing really, really fast. And now, uh, I want to challenge that there, uh, I think since um, we've had colonisation in Australia, we've actually seen things continually moving fast and that part of the problem is to be able to do that change in a way that is sustainable. So I want to question though the whole concept of doing things fast because um, as uh, in modern world, say since 1900, which is I guess relatively modern, we, we've actually seen things being adopted and changing the world really quickly. So this is New York Fifth Avenue in 1900, and you can see it's mostly horses and carts, and I've circled one car. So that's something where um, there's um, you know, hu huge interest. You can see at least they're on, um, they've worked out which side of the road to go on and all that. 
13 years later, this is the same, same road. And you can see suddenly in 13 years, it's all cars. There's actually one horse and cart there. Phenomenal change. And the thing that's really interesting is that you will see rapid change happen when you have not just the right technology, but you also have to have the business model that works so that people will adopt it. And, um, and so in this case, it's a Ford motor car company being able to work out how to create um, the high throughput of uh, manufacturing and you know, the production line approach to manufacturing and also having it so that it's done cheaply so that anybody could afford to buy a car. So it's that whole mentality. And we've seen that happening with things like Amazon with their business model for uh, buying books over the internet. They actually sell the books at cost what they, um, they make their money by investing them. When you pay your bill, they don't pay their bills for 30 days. They invest their money and, um, and they make their money by investment, not by actually selling books. It's probably changed since then, but that was their original one. With iTunes, again, that's about to change, but you, um, people will buy things by downloading it on the internet. Even though the quality of the music is poor, it's convenience and it's a new model based on technology. What's going to happen in the future with driverless cars? Who knows? But that's, um, we still have to change 700 laws before we can actually have our driverless cars and work out. But there's huge issues then when we start thinking about things such as um, cultural things. For example, just say we're in a situation where a, a, a driverless car has to make a decision. Do I run over granny or do I run over a child? And it depends on what culture. If you go from a Western culture, we'll say uh, kill the granny, sorry, and uh, keep the child. While in, um, in Eastern cultures, it's uh, kill the child and keep the granny. So it's, it's, it's one of these things where some of these auto autonomous systems have got really deep questions which we as a community need to be engaged with. So one of the things that's most important for organisations like CSIRO is that for us to progress our research, we have to be deeply involved with social science. We have to be deeply involved with the ethics and we have to be deeply involved with society to make sure that you get to choose the way we introduce the, the, um, the technologies. And this is still happening now. So this is in 2005. That's people going and seeing the Pope. And you can see they're sort of looking towards the Pope. And um, a few years later, this is uh, people in the same room seeing the Pope again. And the thing that now we, uh, you may not, but we, uh, we experience life through our mobile phones now. So that it's, um, it's almost like that already an augmentation where um, most people don't remember a phone number anymore. They, um, they actually rely on their phone. And so this is, again, another example of technologies that have come over and, and the whole thing from whether it's Facebook and that is now having some unintended consequences, such as the whole business of, um, of the things where people are questioning whether Brexit and, um, and the 2016 election was influenced by inappropriate use of, um, or, well, you could call it inappropriate, depends on where you stand, um, use of advertising in, um, on Facebook, which has been using um, databases that are able to identify people's preferences and therefore be able to feed information specifically designed to influence you one way or another. These are the sorts of things where science and technology runs into us as humans and we, as a society, I think, need to do better at working out what we accept and what we won't. And that's also probably a role for government to make a decision on when do they have to step in and put rules and regulations in place. So we've got all these problems, um, or, or all these things happening, and information and knowledge is growing too. So er, this is looking at, this is um, uh, Bucky's or Buckminster Fullerene's um, a knowledge curve of saying that um, we're getting a doubling of every year of knowledge. So we're getting to a point now where we've got so much knowledge, we don't even know how to deal with it. It's a bit like, um, you know, how, how many people are able to read the whole newspaper every day or read all the books you want to read because there's just so much there. So why is it that we've got all this knowledge, yet we're not, um, we're not able to deal with it? Well, the first thing is scientific knowledge is growing, and you can sort of see it's exponential. That's uh, looking at a graph showing the increase in the number of articles over time, and you can see it's whizzing up. And then not every article has a new idea, so the increase in the number of new ideas is also increasing. Uh, the number of patents, which are new inventions, are also going up at a great rate. But with all this new knowledge, we're still having trouble that we're getting problems coming up at our doorstep. So drought is a major issue. Uh, Murray-Darling Basin, we saw over the Christmas period where all those millions of fish died. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef is really under, under pressure and, and we've seen these bleaching events. 
Uh, we're in a, a country which is dependent on coal for, for most of our um, energy generation, and yet we know that it's uh, contrib contributing to global warming. We've got an industry mix which is pretty traditional, and is it one which is going to leave us in a good position for the future? So what are the future industries that we need to create now so that we're able to make sure that we're a globally competitive nation and, and be able to have the lifestyle and the um, GDP that we need in order to um, be successful and, and um, have the well-being that we desire? Just last month, we had a report uh, saying that uh, one million species are at risk of extinction in um, the next decade. We had last week uh, news that um, all that plastic rubbish we were sending off to China that then went to Malaysia is, guess what, coming back to our doorstep again. So how we deal with waste is something which is a huge, huge problem and we haven't really addressed. So these are just some of the um, problems that we have to deal with. And then there's this other, as digital world is happening, if you, some work that was done at the end of last year by uh, consultants Alpha Beta Digital Innovation, they looked at what are the new industries, and if you look at it where Australia is, they've looked at existing industries, uh, future digital industries, and if you look here um, at the bottom part, the growth of digital exports um, is something which Australia is not doing well at. And so if we're going to be, again, having the industries that are globally competitive, we have to do something about that. The world is realising that these problems are universal, and so the UN actually created some years ago the Sustainable Development Goals. The problem is that they're not like solve each one of them one by one and the world will be wonderful. Some of those uh, global uh, goals are ones which are actually fighting against each other, and so to fix one will cause more impact on another in a negative way. So we used that in CSRO to try and work out what can we do as an organisation. We've got a fixed, um, a, a fixed budget and we realise that we're here to do something important. So with all this information, we, we've sort of asked ourselves what can we do. So what we've done is come up with identifying what we think are the six challenges for Australia. And we think we need to have sustainable energy and resources. We realise we need to have a secure Australia and region, and that's not just with defence, but also biosecurity. We need to make sure we're set up for future industries, and I'll explain why that's in a different colour in a minute. We need to have resilient and valuable environments. We need to have um, food security and quality. We need to, re there's some number that's saying we need to increase food production by 70% if we're going to be able to feed the country, the nation, the world, if we are seeing their population growing at the rate it is. And then we also, of course, are health, want to have health and well-being. But the thing that's really interesting with all those major challenges, every one of them to have a solution is going to require a whole new business, a whole new industry. And so there's the potential for um, creating the new industries, companies, businesses, in order to be able to deliver on that. For example, the Great Barrier Reef, that's the size of New Zealand. So if we're going to be having more, um, more sensors to be able to measure what's going on, if we're going to have, say, a rollout of some new um, coral reefs that, or coral material that is, and biomaterials which can live in slightly warmer water, which they're looking at as an option for, um, for maintaining the Great Barrier Reef, then someone's going to make that, someone's going to deliver it, someone's going to maintain it. And so that's a whole new growth opportunity, a whole new business opportunity, which means that it turns around our head the whole way we're looking at these problems, not as just a, um, a drain on our expenses and government, you know, please pay up, but also the potential of turning it on its head and creating new opportunities. So these problems are big, and if we could have solved them, we would have already. But the problem is that... Um, that we can't because the problem is so great and the issues are so interconnected. And one of the things we're beginning to realise is that we need to make the most of digital capability with domain science to use all that data, which we're calling sort of like the new oil, so that we can have massive integration of um, diverse data sets so we can have new breakthroughs, that we have sensors and automation to be able to feed real-time information so we can have decision and actions happening. For example, our people in land and water in CSRO said that if we had had the Murray-Darling Basin all censored up and had that way of being able to get that information with the sort of machine learning to understand that, um, uh, what that is telling us, we could have actually um, had a digital twin that said, let's just test if we flush the river by letting go some water from the dams, clean it out like we do with a toilet, and uh, we would have been able to solve, uh, prevent that, that um, influx of um, fish deaths. 
that would have, and then we would have been able to model what were the unintended consequences by having a digital twin. That's sort of like having a description of a, of a situation in a computer so you can test things. So you have um, making sure that your data is, is uh, critical and contested, that it's correct, that uh, we actually make sure that we avoid having data monopolies, which we're seeing with Facebook at the moment, where, um, where they're holding data, which means that people can't access it to be able to make sure that we've got that openness to be able to control things so we don't have these unintended consequences or things which may lead to control that um, have outcomes which may not be best for society and that we live in an organized or a world where we have a digital ecosystem so that we have a cooperative approach so these are the sorts of things which we think are needed now as we're venturing into how all this data can be used in new ways the thing is that um, this all requires artificial intelligence and DARPA which is a US defense sort of futuristic science group have identified a list of priorities last year and they said artificial intelligence is absolutely critical because if we're going to do and work and uh, succeed in answering and solving these problems, we have to do it at a faster pace. So these new tools are going to affect the way scientists do their work. And this is something that's a bit scary as a scientist. So instead of doing animal testing, we actually think we can do organs on chips in the future and have genome um, foundries that can culture tissues so that animal testing will be probably a thing of the past. Instead of going into the lab and doing chemical experiments, we'll be able to do chemical experiments in computers so it will improve the, um, the uh, health and well-being of our staff because uh, chemical experiments are actually quite dangerous as well as being a lot cheaper. We'll be able to get visualisation of data sets in ways which allows us to in, uh, have data engaging with our brains in ways so that we can see information in different ways. We'll be able to have all those sensors in the field so instead of people going out and doing field tests, every six months, then taking 80 months to analyze the data, and then by the time they've got the information that's out of date, we'll be able to do that in real time and hopefully get to a point where we have that real-time solution. But to do that also requires incredible computing power. And so um, CSRO looks after the Pawsey computer, which is um, based in Western Australia. We're, we're going to be seeing that happening more and more. Um, and uh, that ubiquitous infrastructure is something we need to make sure is accessible. We're looking at what new science needs to be done in artificial intelligence and machine learning, and so we've developed a future, that FSP means future science platform, looking at how to have the data platforms, how to make sure we are, can extract the features that are necessary to make decisions, how to develop models around them so that we can make those decisions, and how we can have data-driven learning. And with that, we need to make sure we've got the ethics, the responsible research, the robustness and causality and explainability so that um, you and everyone in the general public and the community can feel trusted. Okay, so CSRO's purpose. So with all that background, our purpose is to solve these greatest challenges. And what we're doing at the moment is trying to understand how we fit in, into, that, into the whole science sector so that we can see things from where the idea is created and it's pulled all the way through to use. So this is sort of something we're putting out there at the moment to try and make sure that all the different research organisations aren't just put into a blender and come up with a mishmash of stuff, but we each have a part to play so that universities are really good at doing pure and basic research with some of it being applied and taken all the way through. CSRO at its, at its best is where we're seen as doing some original research or some of that pure and basic stuff, but seeing how it's brought all the way through and applied and taken to scale so it's able to deliver on these challenges. And then we've also got the um, co uh, cooperative research centres which link universities, government labs and industry together. And then uh, what we're hoping is by um, pulling that together with much better set up and recognition of who plays what role, we're going to see better ecosystems of work, people working together. We're going to see better outcomes and delivery of the investment into something which will make a bigger difference. So we'll be able to have um, that coherence and scale. We'll be able to create um, networks that we can um, make sure we have all the right skills in the right place and hopefully accelerate that innovation. But it requires us to operate instead of a whole lot of individual groups doing their own thing, working together in tandem as a cooperative or an ecosystem. So I'd like to say that research was really simple and you come up with a, a, an idea and then you do an experiment and then maybe you cure cancer. But this is actually the genealogy which uh, Bob Freighter, who was one of our very senior people um, in CSRO um, some years ago, he's, a, he's in his 80s now and a very dear person to CSRO, he actually put this together trying to track the history or genealogy of the invention of Wi-Fi. 
to just get across the idea that it's really complex, so that it really requires us to think deeply about um, how we invest our, our energies, because it's not as though it's easy to predict which way to go. Those white boxes are the training of the people, and then there's different things along the way where there's um, pulling information from different places and finally coming up with Wi-Fi. The other is also that um, we've found too that you start small. So small projects lead to is where the disruption happens, but the impact comes about by actually having large and uh, things at scale. So we want to make sure if we're going to solve these problems, that we're not just working on our world on our own, but we're part of pulling together the world's best teams. We want to attract talent. We want to have that scale and focus. We also want to inspire the nation. We want to provide the confidence for students choosing a career. We want to see that we're the land of startups. So 97% of companies in Australia are startup companies. 70% of those have less than 20 people. So we want to inspire people to actually start their company and start translating work from the laboratory by starting up businesses and having it happen here. We realise that focus is needed. We need that linking the sector is needed. And if we do all that, I actually think we're going to address uh, those problems and have the impact that we have. So CSRO has a track record of doing that, and this is something we want to do better at. We are able to um, work on the strategic priorities. Uh, we have lots of customers. We work with lots of uh, small businesses. We interact internationally. We actually are able to leverage Australian money with money from overseas, which is important. We, and we work with all the different people I've listed there. But remember, to deliver on any mission requires us to have a chain of small businesses that link together to provide things from whether it's a sensor, whether it's a um, logistics, whether it's a maintenance. And so one of the things we're also doing is working closely with industry. So for example, up in Sydney, we have a collaboration hub. We've got a number of them, but this is one example where we have had four companies who come on, they, they turn around, they've at the moment a head count of 150 people, and our star child is Baraha. In three years, they've gone from two guys in their garage, now employing 100, um, um, well over 100 people. And they're creating a LiDAR system for uh, autonomous systems, and uh, they're going to take over the world. And it's just so exciting to see all these young engineers working really hard on a, on a mission of trying to create a whole new business. We actually think it's sort of going to be one of those um, ubiquitous um, capabilities and, and products which you know, will have Baraja inside. Baraja just means a pack of cards in Spanish. Something else that CSRO is able to do is help scale up. So that is a big, you might have heard of the valley of death from where it's invented to where industry uses it. It's that scale up period where you're able to do something uh, to do the pre-commercial work is where we're at our best. And so we were able to do that. And then the other thing is also just spinning out companies and um, supporting that with, um, we've got a, um, an accelerator program helping people to understand what it takes to commercialise things. We also have our main sequence ventures through uh, the government investment in um, the NISA program looking at um, the innovation program from uh, 2016, which has started up, up a venture capital company that allows us to invest. So I'm just going to finish off with uh, an example so um, to sort of show how it brings together. So let's say we want to solve sustainable and energy resources and create a future industry and have something that impacts uh, our environment. And one of the things we've been looking at is hydrogen, a new energy source for us. So the idea is you use solar power uh, to create electricity that separates the air so that you get nitrogen. It also separates using electrolysis water to get hydrogen. You bump that together to create ammonia, and that can be shipped around as a, as a way of exporting, so replacing things like um, uh, um, uh, fossil fuels with something like hydrogen. So it'll become a whole new export industry for us. The problem with that is if you're going to use hydrogen as a fuel, how do you actually separate it out? And um, so they've worked out all the different bits. So they've got the uh, reducing the cost of production, the gasification routes, how to do all the transport and that. But there was one thing missing, and that was how do you take the ammonia to create the hydrogen? So back in 2007, we funded a small project where one of our clever scientists, again, this idea of disruption done at the small scale, came up with this idea of a membrane where um, in, normally I use a platinum one, and he came up with another material. And he was able to produce um, high, pure hydrogen, but, um, and with that, be able to create that pathway that was missing, that little gap in that, that sort of critical pathway. And as a consequence, we've now got a whole new hydrogen industry starting. We've got Twiggy Forest investing in it. Um, 
And, um, and we've got Japan knocking on our doorstep saying, we want you to export hydrogen through ammonia to us to replace coal. And so what we're, our vision is, um, now we're seeing where oil and coal is a major part and, and fossil fuels are a major part of our um, energy mix, that by 2050, you're gonna see a whole different new industry. And we've done this in many time, ways where we've solved um, major problems. So um, plastic banknotes is something that CSRO invented um, and got rid of the problem with counterfeiting. This is something that was done with uh, Melbourne University. Continuous wear contact lenses was something which we did with the Vision CRC and University of New South Wales is something which is now ubiquitous. Uh, we've developed through the grains and then food production of, um, of new, in this case, Barley Max, which is a fabulous uh, barley, which when it's made into a food product, allows you to reduce your cholesterol, reduce your weight, um, have better um, gut health, and uh, reduce your uh, um, chance of obesity and also high blood pressure and heart attack. So we should all be eating that for breakfast. It tastes great. Um, and then another thing, which is um, working with a company, this is a green whistle, which is uh, analgesic which removes pain. And um, it's uh, used by paramedicals, and you might have seen it on Bondi Lifesaver or on, on, um, on footy fields or whatever. And we helped this company, we helped them develop it to begin with, and then uh, they had the Australian market, $3 million company, and then they came to us and said, we want to export to the world, but we can't make the chemistry scale. So we actually invested with them to work out a new technique and worked at a whole new process, chemical process, and in uh, less than a decade, that company's gone from being a $3 million company to being well over $300 million company, exporting to the world and removing... The most important thing, though, is not only creating uh, a new business, but it's actually removing acute pain from millions and millions of people. Thing is, though, a bright idea, 20 years later, that's where your product is. And so one of the things we're trying to look at is, can we accelerate that um, cycle? There's this thing called the Gartner hype curve, where you start with a great idea, you might see here, innovation trigger, and then everyone's really, really excited, and you get a peak of excitement, and then we realization, oh, it's not gonna deliver it. We thought it was, a trough of disillusionment, and then eventually, if you hang in there through that valley of death, you get to a point where you get something which becomes ubiquitous. We wanna see, can we squash that down? Because that's a you know, 20, 30 life cycle so one of the things we've been doing is saying, can we accelerate our science? And we've created these future science platforms of which the hydrogen is one of them. And I'll just give you some examples. Can we actually improve the way we um, look at autonomous design for, um, for in looking at autonomous systems or robots? And one of the things we're looking at is creating um, autonomous systems so that they can move humans out of the things that are either repetitive or dangerous. And an example is developing a robotic skin so that it's, um, you're able to have robots go into, for example, a fire or a dangerous place and be able to remove humans. So that's something where we've now got a, a whole new material, which is also being used as an early offshoot as a, um, a fabric for, um, for uh, people going into the ocean uh, for uh, skins or whatever they call it. But also looking at a whole new way of designing um, uh, robots from the materials to the components to robots. And we're actually leading the world in that robotic development. Um, water technology is absolutely critical. So we're getting to a point where we've got membranes and no, not, is not a condom. Um, that is uh, a, a filter that's being made with graphene. And that's allowing us to not only have um, the ability to take Sydney Harbour water, which is that young research has done, and be able to drink it by passing it through this filter, they've also developed it so it doesn't get biofouling. So suddenly we're gonna be able to have um, water um, filtration in a way which has just never been done before. We're looking at transforming industries so that they are looking things which are dangerous and big like that, uh, to the one at the bottom where it's um, small and modular and fit for purpose. And then for things like um, uh, the coral reef, oh, that's, um, is one where uh, looking at all the sensors and the whole idea of introducing a whole new way of looking at solving problems. So just to finish off, I want to finish with a personal reflection. So when I talked about people who worked in, the, um, in government labs, I'm one of them. I've worked in the organisation for 34 and a half years. And during that time, I've had 19 different roles. And when I was a researcher, this is my claim to fame. You might just see it there. What you're looking at is a transmission electron micrograph. And that bit there, which looks like that white line that's going at an angle, that's a grain boundary, which I've worked out how to force. That's looking at a high temperature superconductor. Superconductors are materials that allow electricity to pass through them without any loss of, um, of power or energy. 
And so when you get an MRI done, that's, um, the uh, magnetic field is created by a superconducting magnet. But you can also use that same material to make detectors of very small magnetic fields. The magnetic fields can be as small as the one that comes from your brain or your heart. And uh, so when this new material was discovered uh, 30 years ago, that's what I worked on. And with that, I was able to make a magnetic field detector uh, that is able to detect these small magnetic fields. And uh, with that, I um, was able to use it for mineral exploration as one application. It's used for others, but this one's uh, the one I'll talk about now. And with that, that's been commercialised, and that has been used to discover nickel sulphide deposits and silver deposits in Australia worth over $6 billion. In fact, I think we're up to about $20 billion worth of mineral deposits have been uncovered by my grain boundary. That single grain boundary, just by the way, that grain boundary is about a nanometre, and your fingernails will grow about a nanometre in the next, um, next minute or two. So just to give you an idea of how small that is. So that's, 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 that's sort of what I've done in CSRO in some of the things. But when I was in 1975, when I finished high school, I actually had this idea that, because um, I came from a Catholic background and, and the idea of um, engaging with people of need was something I was interested in. And I worked in, um, in Burke with, um, with the Aboriginal people there. And I had this realisation that at, in 1975 there were people living on a mission outside of Burke, that they had, they had lost their culture and that it was one where I realised I wanted to change the system. And the thing that I guess I find really exciting in CSRO at the moment is that I've been able to live that because I went away, I thought I was going to be a school teacher, but decided that, um, that I love research and that actually I can have a bigger impact by working in a government lab like CSRO and doing things that make a difference. But all the time in the back of my mind, I've been wondering about my original desire to try and see how can I make a difference to, um, to see whether or not the richness of the knowledge that Indigenous people have, the richness of their culture, can be brought into science. And something which we're doing in CSIRO at the moment is actually recognising that and looking at how we can use Indigenous knowledge to solve um, challenges. And, um, and we're going through a process of co-development to see how we can uh, bring that together to help us understand that. So the way we're organising ourselves at the moment is that we've got those challenges which I mentioned earlier on. We've got um, the cross-cutting capabilities that are helping us to use different parts of science to solve them. But we're also looking at how we can use um, Indigenous know-how to be able to inform us on some of the things. And I, I guess most recently, uh, the realisation of this is happening universally. With that, that press release of a million species at risk of um, extinction, uh, the report from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Diversity and Ecosystem Services uh, put in that press release that, um, it's probably too small to read, at Circle Bit, but it said for the first time ever, there re there's a realisation of the role of Indigenous knowledge. And that's something which I sort of feel like it's full circle of how um, we need to be making sure that when we're looking at solving these problems, that we're using the full human potential, and that's including our Indigenous people. And that's also not just in looking at, um, at the uh, work on environment, but also things where there's um, bush medicine, and this is a beautiful um, artwork that sort of embraces that beautifully. So this is a nice picture which is looking, uh, one of my colleagues put together, that's a whole lot of people working in CSIRO and looking into the future. And I hope today you'll take away the idea that government labs are hidden gems. They've got people who have lifelong commitments, really working on trying to have mission-directed um, research that solves the greatest challenges. They're each playing a role that uh, is supporting the nation. And their results of their work touches every aspect of your life every day. And I think the impact on Australia is immeasurable. And I hope that you'll take that away and think about that so that um, you can encourage people to be inspired by the work that is being done, but also maybe encourage people to think about that as a career path as well. So uh, thank you. I'm feeling we should have given you at least another hour. I'm sorry, it was <laughs> wonderful. It really, you know, it's touched on some amazing things. We've got, we're pressed for time, but are there a couple of questions? Uh, I thought there might be. Why don't we go here and then to you, sir? So, yes, please, yes. Yeah. David Denham is my name. Is it on this thing? Yes, it is. Yes, yep. it is. Good. Thanks very much, Cathy. That was a compelling talk on the importance of science in 
today's world in Australia. And that was, uh, I hope that's all up on the website so that we can access it because we'll, it's... We'll, uh, well, we'll make sure... You're going to work on that, yeah. eh? That's good. <laughs> the only th missing thing is that we can't somehow persuade our political masters that what you've said is the real thing and they should be focusing on it because when you look around, uh, say the basic things like um, our internet speed, we're now mm. lower than Russia and we're slipping down the yeah. table every year. Uh, the percentage of research on GDP is declining and has done for the last 10 years or so. And we just can't seem to get our act together. Um, we're looking at new technologies. I mean, we've got 19th century technology running down from Gungalin to Civic in Canberra. Mm. And uh, the climate change and the uh, Murray-Darling Basin. So the question is... Sorry about all that long introduction. <laughs> no, that's a good but question. the question is, what can we do to try and persuade our political masters, and I put that in inverted parentheses, sure. I guess, that really we should be focusing more on science and technology? That is a really good question, and uh, it's one where um, you, know, you, you think, oh, gosh, I work for the government, and I, like, how do I answer that? But I think it's actually... Good. I think the science sector has to get its act together a bit better, and that's why this idea of... Um, you, might, you might remember I said, I actually think up till now we've been putting all the components of our science sector into the blender and hopefully come up with a blancmange. And as a consequence, I think no-one really understands who does what, and so the um, and there's all this money going in, and it's not really clear what where it, the return on investment is. So I, I think one of the things we need to do, first of all, with the sector is to understand who does what. And not everybody is expected to do the same role and that everyone has their place. I think if we do that, we'll start to see a lot of, um, first of all, improvements on, um, on making sure that things happen and that what is started is finished and is, can me has measurable impact. So that's, that's one thing which I think the sector needs to do so that instead of fighting amongst ourselves over the crumbs of research funding and mm -hmm. putting our hand out saying, um, we're, we're, we're smart, give us money, we will solve your problems, and then saying, well, where are the solutions? We're not seeing them. I think we need to be better at that. So that's the first thing. But then the other is also, I think we're at a really interesting time um, where um, I think that we're seeing, after the last election, a willingness to have a bit more bipartisan approach to things. I might be wrong, I might be optimistic here, but I think if we're able to show that um, the pathways in terms of it not being just a small, and this is something which I think in Australia we've done, is um, um, in the past everything's done institution by institution mm -hmm. instead of looking at how things are linked together. And I know uh, last week Karen Andrews, who's, the new, uh, who's our Minister for Science... Um, industry and technology has put the uh, has put out her view of saying I she wants to have a hundred day plan or pull, use the next hundred days to create a plan and I think what she's asking for is input on how things all fit together instead of having all these little siloed things. I think if we were able to show how everything is knitted together, almost like and I use the idea of a patchwork quilt, so you show how things are stitched together. And I'll give a really simple example. Um, uh, industry PhDs have come up as an example of saying this is great where students go and do a degree, a graduate degree in science, and, um, but they do it in collaboration with an industry partner so they can see a different pathway. Mm. And, um, and if you look around the country, there's all these industry PhDs popping up all over the place, but they're not coordinated. So she's put the challenge to the community to say, come up with a proposal and bringing it all together. But to do that, you need to also have it as not just a standalone, but it needs to be linked into the, the pipeline of students wanting to, you know, mm. Australian students wanting to come and do PhDs, because to be frank, the majority of PhD students in Australia are overseas students. And so if we're trying to train people to boost the quality of our industry to improve, you know, improve the people who then go on and um, with that higher education to be able to help grow um, the wealth of intellect and approach to in that then we need to be bringing people through. So it's, it's the idea of knitting things together. Uh, I, I think that's the only way we're going to do it. I think um, demanding, follow this, believe me, I'm a scientist, I know what's best, 
No one even believes that. I mean, we're seeing that the last election has shown that even society is not willing to take that on board. So I think we need, it's a responsibility for us to actually show how it knits together as a community and put that forward. And I think that's when we're going to see the outcome. So a final question to do. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you for that talk, Dr Foley. It was most informative and instructive. Um, I think I can help with an answer to the last que oh, to the question that's just been asked. <laughs> and, uh, I love that. Th this really emerged in my mind as a comment to make before helping to answer a question. Um, and arising particularly from your, the last part of your address when you talked about the challenges for the future, a whole range of them with all those blue dots on the board. Um, and my suggestion is that you try and persuade our political masters that funding the various organisations, looking into science as you and the others are, shouldn't be seen as a cost but as an investment. Mm. And I think that's a point that ought to be pressed. It's emerging in the field of education. No, it's not a cost, it's an investment. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have a question, but in getting to that first, I'll just add something to one of the examples you quoted, which I think you might find amusing. It relates to AeroGuard, that's invention by Doug Waterhouse. Mm. Um, and you brought the Queen into the conversation. Well, I can tell you how she got there. Uh, she came to Australia in the 1960s, I've forgotten which year, and I was part of the organisation managing the Royal Visit. Oh, wow. <laughs> and when she got to Darwin, I was sitting quietly at my desk and... Uh, somebody from the household uh, got in touch with me and said, look, there's a new product in Australia called AeroGuard. The Queen gets worried by sand flies biting her legs in Darwin. Uh, could you try and find some AeroGuard? So I took that on and sent somebody around all the pharmacies in Darwin. They'd never heard of it nor had the Darwin Hospital heard of it. So who was the problem? The Queen wanted it, and I had to get it. <laughs> so I found my office in Canberra and said, get some air guard and get it up here. <laughs> now, the, it was found in some pharmacies in Canberra, and I think about a dozen cans were bought, but then there was a logistical problem of getting it up, which involved a lot of aircraft. I won't go into the details of that because <laughs> it's a little bit... Uh, something I shouldn't go into, but we, we got it there. It's a statute of limitation. And, and when <laughs> she used it, she didn't like the smell of it. <laughs> it does smell pretty awful. I, I, I believe in her next visit to Darwin, uh, the question was asked, would she like some Merigard? And not this time, thank you. <laughs> but it is great stuff, isn't it? It is, yeah. Now, I'll get to my question. It's something that's bothered me for a long time. Uh, you have listed in your talk a whole range of major uh, processes and products that have evolved from CSIA research. And there's a lot more to the list than you mentioned today. Uh, now, I have had an impression over time, rightly or wrongly, that, other, that the intellectual property in those developments has not really been safeguarded enough. Oh. And that other organisations or manufacturers from overseas get a patent and then we find paying, we in Australia are paying royalties to somebody else for something that was really our own. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, as these new uh, developments or findings occur, is the CSIRO and other government organisations really nailing down, nailing down the intellectual property? Mm -hmm. And similarly, yep. you, you may, this is getting beyond the government agencies, but are the universities and other research institutions really mm -hmm. okay. on, onto that? It's a good question. So um, I think probably in the past, probably not. Uh, but it's something where I think uh, CSRO is actually quite sophisticated in the way it manages intellectual property now. So it's always a balance because, uh, say, if you patent something, it's only a 20-year period that you've got to commercialise it and get a return on that investment. 
So you've got to pick and choose. It's quite expensive to patent something over its lifetime. And um, so we, we actually have quite um, the highest number of invention disclosures in the country. It's um, uh, every year. And then, the, and then a number of those turn into actual patent applications. And some of them go through from being provisional for the first year and then to a full one. You sort of have different, um, uh, I, I guess, fall off as you go along because you only want to invest in the, in the patenting of the most useful ones. And um, I think uh, CSRO is now very sophisticated in the way it does its patenting. It's uh, probably uh, leading in the country in many ways. Uh, because we've had to also fight for our patents. So, for example, the wireless LAN patent was one where Australia, or CSRO made the decision to fight people who were using the intellectual property without paying royalties. And so it returned some hundreds of millions of dollars back to Australia, which was then folded back into research into the country. And, um, and so we've got a track record of actually standing up to people who are, um, are using our intellectual property. Uh, but there's also, it's interesting, there's a bit of a shift as time's going on where um, there's a question of whether, you know, what you'll see some things patented, but there's also things are turning over so quickly that uh, there's a move to a first to market as being the way to get your return on investment. So doing things fast, because as soon as you've got something onto the market, because it's very, and other people copy you, it's, um, it might be faster just being ahead of the head of the game all the time. So there's some some variations in in the way of managing intellectual property that's happening as things are speeding up, and also things are becoming more digital, and um, and the turnover of technologies is happening at a faster rate. But overall, um, I think on average we're doing all right. Universities, um, I think, are, are very um, very keen on patenting and. Uh, but an awful lot of stuff is still published that probably is picked up by others, but it works the other way around as well. It's always a tricky question. It's not a perfect answer but because there's not a single universal um, homogenous answer. But um, I think as an organisation, we're doing pretty well. We actually bring in quite significant millions of dollars mm. every year from our royalties, and, um, and that's folded back into our research. And so, for example, the continuous wear contact lenses we earned um, many, um, many millions of dollars. Uh, like um, I think we were getting something like between seven and twelve million dollars a year, or something, in royalties until that patent ran out, and so that was folded back into a whole lot of other research, looking at, for example, stem cell research and things like that, which are just beginning to emerge now into being new technologies. So we, we have um, definitely made money from from licensing, and it's something which is a very, very major part of our business models. Mm. Thank you very much, because time is defeated, so I'll I'm be very, sorry, very quick. Long. No, 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 not at all. No, um, and you could hear the interest in what you've had to say, mm. but I, I just think we've, we've really had a, a glimpse of the future and it, it looks quite bright, I think. So thank oh. you. Um, can you join me in thanking thank Dr. Thank you very much. <laughs>